My name is Johan Sanen. I am a cardiologist at the Antwerp University Hospital, and together with uh, Bart Lewis, we uh, founded a cardiogenetics clinic about 10 years ago. So we are working in the field of uh, sudden cardiac death prevention, um, and uh, me as an electrophysiologist, I am especially interested in the arrhythmogenic disorders that are causing sudden cardiac death. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of the ESHG virtual conference for giving me the opportunity to give this educational talk on arrhythmogenic disorders. Let me turn off my camera so you can see the full slides. In this presentation, I will try to explain why cardiogenetics are important. I will talk about the normal electrical functioning of the heart, and I will uh, try to explain uh, the basic, uh, some basic mechanisms that lead to arrhythmogenesis in the heart. Um, and then finally, we can, um, I can introduce you to some of the hereditary arrhythmia syndromes um, that are an Im important causes of sudden cardiac death uh, in the young. So why cardiogenetics? When we talk about cardiogenetics, we actually talk about sudden cardiac death. And we all know these uh, publications in the media where these seemingly perfectly healthy people suddenly collapse and, uh, and die. Um, and in the media, often this is referred to as a, an acute heart failure or as an, uh, a myocardial infarction. Uh, but actually, the cause of this is, uh, um, in many cases, remains completely unknown. And it becomes even more striking when these, uh, when these people that uh, experienced certain cardiac that were family from each other um, due to one disease that was, uh, that was running in the family as a hereditary cause. Um, most often, these are very young people um, that, uh, that never had any symptom in their life. The definition of sudden cardiac death is the unexpected death due to heart problems within one hour after the onset of symptoms. And it is very important to realize that in up to 93% of the cases, the sudden cardiac death event is caused by malignant ventricular arrhythmias. The incidence of uh, sudden cardiac death is quite high with one to two per 1,000 person years affecting all ages. Um, and uh, it is important to know that many of those patients uh, on beforehand were completely asymptomatic. Uh, when the patient has survived a sudden cardiac death event, often no um, structural uh, cardiac abnormalities um, are being detected, so there is often no detectable disease. And it is important to realize that in one third of the patients, sudden cardiac death is actually the first symptom of the underlying disease. Um, we know that when patients have a sudden cardiac death event, that the uh, survival rate uh, after uh, uh, of, of CPR is uh, is poor, is uh, um, five to ten percent uh, at the maximum. Um, and when the patient has uh, has not survived, um, yeah, many of the autopsies uh, are uh, uh, turn out negative and do not find any structural abnormalities uh, in the heart. By far, the most prevalent cause of sudden cardiac death is coronary artery disease. But when we look at the, at the younger population, so in patients that are younger than 45 years, then we know that sudden cardiac death in up to 80% of the cases is caused by a hereditary disease. And there we can uh, differentiate three important groups. The first one is the primary electrical disorder group. The second one are the cardiomyopathies. And the third one are the aneurysmal uh, diseases. The main purpose of sudden cardiac death management, of course, is prevention. First, we want to prevent new events recurring in the sudden cardiac death survivor. And for that, of course, we use ICD implantations, we use medication, we try to avoid the triggers, and we introduce lifestyle modification to prevent new arrhythmias from happening in the proband. Second, we also would like to prevent new sudden cardiac death events in his relatives. But for that, we need to be able to identify high-risk individuals um, that are also, or that might also be present in the family. And third, we are uh, able to prevent transmission to offspring um, using prenatal testing and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD. In order to be able to uh, come to good prevention of these kind of disease in the proband, but also in high-risk uh, relatives, and also to try to uh, prevent transmission to the offspring, we first have to know what the cause of the sudden cardiac death event was. And as you already heard, it is uh, sometimes very difficult to identify the underlying cardiac disease, as no structural abnormalities have been, uh, have been uh, identified in many cases, and as no uh, symptoms were there uh, on beforehand in the patient. 
Um, and then eventually when the patient has died, also the autopsy is negative. So this poses a huge challenge to try and identify the underlying disease when sudden cardiac death occurs in many cases. Um, and so that is also one of the reasons why it is very important to know all the diseases that, uh, um, that can lead to sudden cardiac death and malignant cardiac arrhythmias. Here you see an overview of the etiology of sudden cardiac death divided in three main groups, structural heart diseases, with the most important one ischemic heart disease, which uh, is uh, um, causing sudden cardiac death in 60 to 80 percent of cases, to a lesser extent congenital heart diseases, and then, then we have also the uh, uh, important group of the non-ischemic cardiomyopathies with dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic and restrictive cardiomyopathy, and on the far right we have the primary electrical diseases, uh, which are mainly long QT syndrome, short QT syndrome, Brugada syndromes, uh, CPVT, uh, and so on. And then we have a third group, which are the atherosic uh, aortic aneurysms and dissection, which we will not go into uh, for this presentation. And when we go from left to right, you can see that the structural basis of these diseases is becoming more weak, and these diseases become more an, uh, an electrical uh, substrate that is uh, leading up to the sudden cardiac death event. It is important to realize that the spinal common pathway leading up to sudden cardiac death for each one of these diseases, whether they are structural heart diseases or primary electrical diseases, are malignant arrhythmias. In up to 93% of the cases, it is a malignant arrhythmia that is causing the sudden cardiac death. So it is important to understand how these arrhythmias can uh, occur in the heart. And for that, we first have to uh, learn about the normal electrical functioning of the heart. The heart is a four-chambered pump that uh, consists out of uh, musculature um, that contracts about 100,000 times a day. Um, and these contractions are uh, driven by electrical impulses that are migrating in depolarization and repolarization fronts over the heart. Um, and this uh, electrical um, impulse um, is orchestrated in a very strict way. So each of these muscle contractions um, is, um, is very finely um, um, uh, regulated um, and uh, each of these 100,000 beats is, uh, is uh, activated in exactly the same way and by that the heart is able to produce a perfusion pressure um, that uh, maintains a uh, pressure in the systemic uh, circulation and also a lower pressure in the pulmonary circulation. The heart is an autonomous organ that generates its own electrical activity and this electrical activity or electrical impulse is generated in the sinus node which is located on the border of the vena cava superior and the right atrium. From here the electrical impulse is propagated to the other um, cells of the atria, first the right atrium and then conducted to the left atrium. When both atria have completely depolarized, both atria will contract and pump the blood from the atrial cavities to the ventricles. In normal conditions, the electrical impulse is not able to migrate from both the atria to the ventricles uh, because there is a, um, a non-conducting um, connective tissue ring between the atria and the ventricles, but there is only one structure that allows conduction from the atria to the ventricles, and this structure is uh, what we call the AV node. This AV node functions as a filter, so it uh, allows only a maximal frequency of uh, um, activation from the atria to the ventricle. Once the electrical impulse has passed the AV node, it conducts through the bundle of His to the bundle branches with a high conduction velocity. As you can see here, the impulse goes to the bundle branches, ramifying into the Purkinje fibers, and uh, causing depolarization of both the right ventricle and also the left ventricle. When both ventricles are depolarized, both ventricles will simultaneously contract and the right ventricle will pump the blood to the arteria pulmonalis and the lung circulation and the left ventricle will pump the uh, blood through the aortic valve to the aorta and the systemic circulation. The transmembrane electrical impulse that can be measured in each cell of the heart is called the action potential. And the action potential consists of a upsloping phase, phase which we call the depolarization phase, 
and a downsloping phase, which we call the repolarization phase. And here you see an uh, action potential uh, waveform in yellow, um, which is the action potential uh, as seen in the sinus node cells. Um, and as you can see, the upsloping or depolarization phase is actually quite slow, while the repolarization phase also is quite slow. In each cell of the heart, the action potential can be measured. And here you see an atrial action potential in green. Uh, and as you can see, the upstroke phase uh, of the action potential, the depolarization phase, is here faster compared to the upstroke phase of the sinus node cells. And this is because the action potential in the atrial cells are mainly sodium driven, while the action potentials that are occurring in the sinus node are calcium driven. Here we see the action potential in red um, that it can be measured in the cells of the AV node, which again is calcium driven and is a more slow uh, type of uh, action potential. Here in purple, we see the action potential of the Hispurkinje fiber system. And here we see the action potential waveform of the myocardium in the ventricles. When we summate all the electrical impulses of one electrical cycle, and for that we use a couple of electrodes that are attached to the body surface of the patient, then we get this rudimentary uh, body surface EKG. On this rudimentary EKG, we can differentiate different elements like the P wave, which is the hallmark of the depolarization phase of the atria, the QRS complex, which is the um, sign of the depolarization phase of the ventricles, and the T wave, which uh, coincides with the repolarization phase of both the ventricles. The repolarization phase of the atria actually coincides with the depolarization of the ventricles and is a very small signal, so it uh, really um, um, is lost in, uh, due to the, um, the large signal um, that is uh, produced by the um, depolarization of both the ventricles. And when we then um, look at this rudimentary ECG beat to beat, uh, and write this down over time, then you get this rudimentary first EKG um, tracing, as you can see here, for a sinus rhythm, um, where we again can see all the different kinds of waveforms with a P wave, a QRS complex, and a T wave. So this is one entire electrical um, cycle of the heart, one uh, producing one beat, and then followed by the next with a P wave and the contraction of the atria, uh, QRS complex, depolarization of the ventricles, and contraction of the ventricles during ST segment, and then we have the T wave for the repolarization phase of the ventricles, and then the next beat, and so on. Here you can see the color coded correlation between the uh, electrical structures of the heart and the different components on the uh, rudimentary EKG. As already mentioned, the uh, EKG um, consists of different waveforms with a P wave, QRS complex, and T wave. And below, you can see again the correlation with what is happening electrically in the heart. On such EKG, we can also measure the time intervals between those different signals uh, of the rudimentary EKG. And uh, here you can see the PR interval, the ST segment, and the QT interval. Um, this QT interval is, uh, for this presentation, the most important, uh, since a prolongation of the QT interval will be um, a condition that is pro-arrhythmogenic and that can lead to malignant arrhythmias such as torsada de point, as you can see, as we will see further in the presentation for long QT syndrome. Underlying the EKG are the action potentials in each cell of the heart. Uh, and here you see the action potential of the ventricle, which uh, is uh, underlying the QRS complex and the T wave, with the depolarization phase of the action potential co coinciding with the QRS complex, and the repolarization phase of the action potential coinciding with the T wave on the EKG. It is important to realize that this relationship between the EKG and the underlying action potentials uh, uh, is always there. And when we zoom in further on the action potential, you can see that it is a very complex cascade of transmembrane ionic currents with inward depolarizing currents shown here in yellow, which are mainly carried by sodium and calcium. And we also have outward repolarizing currents, uh, which are mainly carried by uh, potassium. And here they are uh, depicted in blue. If we then simplify this very complex picture, we can um, we can divide the uh, ionic currents in depolarizing forces, which are mainly carried by sodium and uh, calcium, and repolarizing forces, which are uh, mainly carried by potassium uh, currents. So the action potential, in a sense, is a dynamic um, 
alteration of the transmembrane potential, which is dynamically balanced by uh, depolarizing and repolarizing forces. In short, depolarization is car carried by sodium uh, currents and calcium currents, and repolarization is carried by potassium currents. And now we are ready to understand some of the basic mechanisms that produce cardiac arrhythmias. If for some reason there is a gain of functional expression in the sodium and uh, uh, calcium currents, that will cause a excessive depolarization. We can imagine that if the depolarization is, is more pronounced than normal, it will take longer time to repolarize the action potential back to its membrane resting potential. And of course, if there is a loss of functional expression, expression in the repolarizing forces carried by the potassium currents, we can also imagine that it will also take longer to, uh, to bring the, um, um, the transmembrane potential back to its membrane resting potential. And the result of that is that the action potential will prolong and it will prolong beyond the normal value uh, and will cause action potential duration prolongation. And this action potential duration prolongation will be um, a condition that is pro-arrhythmogenic um, for the long QT syndrome. And Here again, we see the relationship between the underlying action potential and the body surface EKG. And now we can understand that if uh, there is a gain of function in the sodium and calcium currents and or a loss of functional expression of the potassium currents, um, resulting in action potential duration prolongation that on the body surface EKG, the T wave, which coincides with the repolarization phase of the action potential, becomes also prolonged. And in many cases, this uh, also causes a uh, notching of the T wave with, with a bizarre, more bizarre uh, and abnormal morphology. And also then you can appreciate that the QT interval uh, will also uh, starts to become prolonged. So action potential duration prolongation can result on the body surface EKG in uh, QT prolongation. So how does action potential duration prolongation as seen in long QT syndrome actually cause arrhythmias? In the next couple of slides, I will show you an example of how these arrhythmias can arise and how action potential duration prolongation um, um, will produce pro-arrhythmogenesis and can uh, predispose patients to sudden cardiac death. When we look at the normal heart, then we know that uh, um, the wall of the heart consists of three functional layers of cardiomyocytes with the epicardial, the midmyocardial, and the endocardial uh, uh, myocytes. And what you have to know is that, uh, that the action potential in each one of these layers um, um, is, has a different susceptibility to action potential duration changes. The midmyocardial cells are more prone to cause action potential duration prolongation compared to the epicardial and the endocardial um, uh, cardiomyocyte action potentials. As such, an action potential duration prolongation will, become, will be more pronounced in the midmyocardial cells compared to the epicardial and endocardial action potential duration prolongation. And this will lead to a disproportionate action potential duration elongation in the midmyocardial cells. In turn, this will cause an increased spatial dispersion of the action potential duration. This is a situation in which intramural reentrant circuits can occur more easily. But the occurrence of intramural reentrant circuits does not necessarily mean that the arrhythmia is already there. We need something else. We need a spark or an initiating beat that actually starts up the arrhythmia. And for the long QT syndrome, this initiating beat is caused by a ventricular extrasystole, mainly due to an early after depolarization or an EAD that actually uh, initiates the electrical circuit, causing an intramural reentrant rotor um, that is meandering um, pancardially over the heart. So this intramural rotor uh, beat to beat will displace itself to another location um, um, from which the, um, the ventricles are activated or depolarized, and this will cause a ventricular uh, arrhythmia, a ventricular tachycardia um, with a morphology that is beat to beat changing um, and is causing this twisting of the points. Um, so it will uh, cause a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that we call torsade de point, the twisting of the points, uh, as you can see on the EKG during this arrhythmia. Here we see uh, an example of an EKG taken during torsada de point initiation with the initiating PVC with a short long short sequence during initiation and then the occurrence of torsada de point with a typical twisting of the points 
This arrhythmia usually uh, self-terminates after uh, 15 to 20 uh, complexes, but at any time it can also degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. This is shown here where torsade de pointe has degenerated into ventricular fibrillation. During ventricular fibrillation, there is no dominant rotor that activates the heart, um, uh, and this results in the fact that there is no concerted muscle contraction any longer. Um, and if there is no emergency intervention imposed on the patient, the patient is likely to die from sudden cardiac death. So now we understand for the long QT syndrome that gain of function in sodium and calcium currents um, and or loss of function um, of the outward uh, potassium, repolarizing potassium currents uh, will cause action potential duration prolongation. And this can be seen on the EKG as QT prolongation. And we now know that this QT prolongation is a condition um, that uh, um, um, produces a higher risk for arrhythmogenesis, where uh, torsade de pointe can occur at any time, um, and this will cause a risk for sudden cardiac death. The short QT syndrome, in many ways, is the mirror image of the long QT syndrome, and now we can easily understand also why a loss of function in the depolarizing forces uh, with sodium and calcium currents and or a increase in the um, repolarizing forces with uh, outward potassium currents will uh, eventually result in action potential duration shortening and this action potential shortening is excessive and pathologic this will cause short qt syndrome on the surface uh, ekg um, and this is a condition that is also pro arrhythmogenic that will cause uh, vf uh, in especially young patients with a high penetrance and high mortality uh, and uh, below on the right hand side you can see an EKG um, tracing of a VF induced um, PVC induced VF uh, in a short QT syndrome patient. The arrhythmogenesis uh, for the Brugrada syndrome as one of the J-wave syndromes uh, can be understood as a um, reduction in the depolarizing force at the beginning of the action potential which will then lead to action potential dome loss, as you can see uh, below. And this will cause in itself a type 1 ECG pattern uh, for Brugada syndrome in the right precordial leads. Um, and this can also co uh, cause phase 2 reentry um, as an arrhythmogenic uh, mechanism, but also due to the, uh, with the depolarization hypothesis, will cause a spatial dispersion in the action potential upstroke phase that will uh, also be a condition that is pro-arrhythmogenic and that can cause ventricular fibrillation. When we look into the arrhythmogenesis of CPVT, then we know that it is caused by an intracellular calcium overload. This slowly arising calcium overload will in turn surpass the um, threshold potential for reactivation of the sodium channels and will then trigger a delayed after depolarization. And if this occurs um, in the or close to the Purkinje network, um, there will be a bidirectional um, focal uh, VT that we call uh, bidirectional VT, as you can see here. And typically this occurs at faster heart rates. Um, during rest, the EKG normally is completely normal, um, but when the rate increases, the calcium overload becomes more and more pronounced, um, and thus this, this will uh, give rise to uh, polymorphic PVCs that uh, become uh, gradually more and more complex and will degenerate into bidirectional VT and VF. We can now summarize the ventricular arrhythmogenesis into one common pathway. So we've seen that changes in the action potential can cause a disproportionate change of the action potential over the three layers of the heart, transmurally, but also regionally and also locally. And this will cause an increase in the action potential dispersion but also this can cause, we've seen that this can cause an increase in voltage gradients um, epicardially and also transmurally, and this also can cause um, more PVCs due to early and late after depolarizations. All in all, so these changes in the action potential will increase the risk for ventricular uh, arrhythmogenesis. In short, any change in the action potential harbors an increased risk for ventricular arrhythmogenesis. So in essence, the hereditary arrhythmia syndromes are diseases that are based on genetic changes to the components of the action potential that lead to increased risk for ventricular arrhythmogenesis. Here we see an overview of the hereditary arrhythmia syndromes with the most common arrhythmia syndromes that have been depicted here. Um, it is important to know that, uh, that all of those um, have a genetic component but some of those also have an acquired form, like the Lanky T syndrome and also the Brugada syndrome, 
where electrolyte disturbances um, and or uh, medication can induce a reversible uh, uh, phenotype of the same syndrome. Um, in many cases, there is also a genetic uh, predisposition. So there's a combination of genetic and acquired factors that uh, produce the arrhythmogenic phenotype. The hereditary form of long QT syndrome, um, here we know that uh, up to uh, 15, and uh, according to some, 17 genes have been associated um, with the long QT syndrome. The first three genotypes based on KCNQ1, KCNH2 and SCN5A mutations are the most important ones. They uh, together account for almost 85% of all genotype long QT syndrome cases. By far the most prevalent form of long QT syndrome is an acquired form of long QT syndrome, which causes a reversible phenotype. Um, and this is caused mainly by uh, disturbances in the electrolyte balance um, that uh, alters the, uh, the ion channel function, uh, causing also QT prolongation. Uh, and of course, we also have the pharmacological interaction where um, a wide variety of compounds is able to block the ion channels that are underlying the action potential duration, causing loss of function and causing action potential duration prolongation and in the end also long QT syndrome. Um, uh, this is a, a wide variety of, of pharmacological compounds that uh, can give rise to this uh, acquired form of long QT syndrome. And you can find those on the website www.crediblemeds.org. It is also important to realize that uh, there's a complex interplay also between genetic variation and this um, uh, pharmacological interaction. Um, so we call this a pharmacogenetic disease. And uh, so there is an overlap between genetic predisposition and also acquired uh, factors that can cause this kind of uh, interaction. The short QT syndrome is again an electrical disease of the heart. It is very rare. Um, there are no structural abnormalities that can be detected in the heart. Um, as already mentioned, uh, the pathophysiology in many ways is the mirror image of long QT syndrome, and it is characterized by an abnormal QTC shortening on the uh, surface ECG and also an abnormal QT adaptation during bradycardia. Um, and it is characterized clinically by unexplained syncopies um, and with a high penetrance, there is a high risk for uh, sudden cardiac death already at young age. For the moment, seven genes have been associated um, in the genetic uh, form of short QT syndrome. But before you do the genetic analysis, it is important to exclude hypercalcemia as a um, condition that also might be shorting the QT, QTC on the ECG. Um, so uh, that is something that has to be ruled out first before uh, we look for genetic uh, short QT syndrome. The Brugada syndrome is an electrical disease with discrete structural abnormalities at the epicardial surface of the anterior and outflow tract uh, right ventricle. Uh, it occurs in 1 to 2,000 persons um, and uh, it is clinically characterized by type 1 ECG that occurs either spontaneous during fever or can be induced by ashmalin. Um, it causes unexplained syncope and sudden cardiac death, uh, mainly during sleep. Until now, 23 genes have been associated with Brugada syndrome, with the first one, SCN5A, being the most important one. Recently, there has been a lot of debate about the uh, 22 other genes, um, so it is unknown whether these genes uh, are able to cause Brugada syndrome in a monogenic fashion. It is uh, highly likely that uh, Brugada syndrome has an oligogenic uh, um, architecture. Um, the next speaker will go into detail about this um, uh, a lot more. A reversible Brugada syndrome phenotype can also be induced by pharmacological interaction. And again, there is a wide variety of uh, compounds that can interact with the ion channels and that can cause uh, type 1 ECG uh, Brugada syndrome. Um, this uh, uh, a list of these uh, compounds can be found on www.brugadadrugs.org.
Early repolarization is a benign finding that can be found in almost 1 to 5 percent of the normal population and in up to 25 to 30 percent of, uh, of athletes um, and is a benign finding. Um, but there is also a rare malignant form that can cause VF and sudden cardiac death. Um, and of course, the challenge is to differentiate the um, benign early repolarization trait on the ECG from the uh, malignant form. About seven genes have been associated with the malignant form of early repolarization syndrome. Um, and again, it is um, uh, postulated that uh, there, is, there is probably an oligogenic architecture in this disease. Catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, or in short CPVT, is, an, uh, is a disease of, uh, of the calcium handling in the heart um, with a prevalence of 1 in 10,000. It's a rare disease um, where we have the classic early onset type where the, um, the first symptoms occur at the age between 7 and 8 years uh, old. But we have an, uh, an, um, a later onset adult uh, type uh, of CPVT. Um, both these types have a very high penetrance um, um, of symptoms with uh, um, having about 80% of symptoms uh, before the age of 40. Um, there is also an atypical CPVT um, where we, we cannot uh, detect the phenotype with our clinical testing. Um, so the clinical features are cardiac syncope induced by stress, by uh, um, situations of increased adrenergic tone. Um, in many cases, it presents itself also as a near drowning and as a sudden infant death syndrome. Um, nearly 50% of the CPVT have been previously diagnosed wrongfully with uh, epilepsy, so they also cause epileptiform syncopes, uh, and uh, many of those have been misdiagnosed as long QT syndrome. In CPVT, there is a calcium overload that is rate dependent, so at rest the EKG is completely normal, but during exercise or during elevated adrenergic tone, um, this calcium overload will induce uh, delayed after depolarizations that will produce um, um, PVCs that become gradually more and more polymorphic when the rate accelerates. Uh, and at a certain time, these uh, PVCs will degenerate into uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Um, and in many cases, this will also produce bidirectional couplets and bidirectional VT um, that can arise and that can degenerate um, into VF. Until now, six loci have been uh, associated with CPVT with the RYR2 uh, gene uh, that encodes the ryanidine receptor uh, being the most important one, the most prevalent one, um, that also shows an autosomal tran uh, dominant transmission. Um, the calcicrystrin 2 and the triadine uh, mutations display a autosomal recessive transmission. With this, I would like to conclude this educational session where we've seen that cardiogenetics are important and that it is mainly um, uh, sudden cardiac death prevention that is the main goal um, of uh, looking into these cardiogenetic diseases. We now know that sudden cardiac death arises from malignant arrhythmias uh, due to these uh, different kinds of diseases, whether they uh, had structural abnormalities or whether they were purely electrical diseases. We know, now know that these malignant arrhythmias arise from changes to the action potential, either uh, uh, on a genetic basis, but uh, in many cases there are also um, acquired aspects like electrolyte disturbances and also pharmacological interaction that can also um, cause uh, these action potential changes that uh, increase the risk to ventricular arrhythmogenesis. Um, so we have to know all these diseases uh, very well to be able to come to a better um, sudden cardiac death prevention. Thank you.